Hello, everyone. This is Mike Knezovich, and welcome to the latest edition of Tune Up with Mike and Mani, Brain Science Step by Step. We're here in Chicago with Dr. Mani Pavaluri, and uh, it's a beautiful morning. How are you today, doctor? I'm doing great, Mike, and it's great to be able to do something meaningful today. Well, let's hope so. Um, we're going to talk about the neuroscience of mindfulness meditation today. Now, that's that's kind of a mouthful, but I know if you're like me and you read a lot, and you read a lot of different kinds of media, I happen to, to be really curious about this because I keep hearing about mindfulness and, and the, the multitude of benefits that practicing mindfulness uh, can bring. And also, uh, the, the mindfulness and meditation and are they the same things? And really, I'm just full of questions. I mean, even even the idea that I've, I've read somewhere that practicing mindfulness or meditation can actually sort of change your brain, like um, physiologically. Uh, um, so I've got a million questions, but um, the first one is, is, is this legit? I mean, I mean, is, 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 is there real science behind this? Um, I, I think that the science is burgeoning as we speak mindfulness is definitely legitimate because there are innumerable number of brain studies now that are published um, that are here to validate changes in the brain mechanisms uh, in different states of meditation and in experienced meditators as well as novice meditators um, and uh, cross-sectionally like you know here and now when they're meditating what's going on versus following them up with a long period of time so there is a lot of evidence on mindfulness that's pres that's available um, I think that mindfulness is absolutely a brilliant idea because it's practiced to reduce stress, promote mental health, physical health and also improve cognitive performance and it's really, Mike, very easy. Remember, it's a non-judgmental attention to the present moment-to-moment -moment experience. All uh, right? Yeah. Okay. So I kind of get it, you know, sort of at a high level and conceptually, but I'm somebody, I don't meditate. Uh, I, I don't think I practice mindfulness right now. What would be a good first step? What would be a good example of of what would you tell me to do as to start? Okay, well, one thing that I've been asking also young children and also uh, parents these days is, um, uh, that is adults, and of course practicing myself is sitting for at least 10 minutes, non-judgmentally focusing on what's going on around us, you know, looking at everything around you gaining attentional control it's almost like increased focus and if you like you can breathe in and breathe out uh, and like normal person like by pay attention to your breathing for 10 minutes every day 10 minutes just sit in one place and focus on your breathing and notice it uh -huh. focus your attention on your own breathing as okay. simple as that and as you do it, there is no judgment, and hopefully you are regulated in your emotion, and you're not like revved up as you start to focus and do something non-judgmental and simple. Mm -hmm. And slowly, there is a self-awareness that develops in the process. Um, therefore, mindfulness meditation involves attentional control, emotion regulation that's automatic, and self-awareness. And eventually, these components of non-judgmental increased focus would lead to some level of self-regulation. Okay. All right. So if I start there, here's, here's my first question is like, my mind, I, tr I, I, I wrestle to focus sometimes of because course. I'm thinking of a hundred things at the same time. But that's not a failure when you sit down to try this, right? I mean, you, the idea is to gradually just keep trying. Keep trying or not even try. Just yeah. kind of like practice a 10-minute focus keep doing on focusing on your breathing. Okay. So I know it's an effortful uh, 
act to begin with. You know, you got to sit down, you know, you got to find a time, hopefully the same time or whenever you can find a time for just 10 minutes or maybe even five minutes. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 that effort to kind of pull yourself together will reduce and your mind wandering will reduce with time as you become uh, like more uh, practiced in this uh, focusing okay. and then in advanced stage actually you don't need any effort and you look forward to that wonderful 10 minutes that that's just for you that's you grab that experience and therefore you know like you you know after this effort you know effortless kind of nice self-preserving mindful non-judgmental focused time that you give for yourself will result in uh some enlightenment and some light-heartedness and you know, dynamic inside feeling that you're more prepared to kind of, you you know, gain uh, more prepared to the next steps and your mind is cleared up. It's almost like this, Mike. Say, take a glass of water, okay? Mm -hmm. And you put sand in it and you sort of wiggle the water. So how is it? Like the sand is all over the water, right? right. I mean, it's just kind of foggy and, you know, like, so with time, all that sand settles down and your water is so clear and you can kind of see through it. That's a great... And there's more clarity. So almost like you are now, you and I are like with the glass with a lot of sand in it, you know. But when you sit down, it becomes more clear and then you're ready for the next um, uh, best uh, thing to do. I like that image and that concept because uh, I don't know it's it's powerful so now we're talking about neuroscience here so um, in some of these changes um, I wonder if you could you know for lay people like myself what kinds of things change I mean we're talking about gray matter white matter all that stuff but I mean so if I do this consistently enough yeah and long enough and, right. in, and with uh, you know uh, sincere intent how would my brain change okay uh, well you said that first of all gray matter white matter yeah i don't know the difference that. to be so honest so let let me just briefly you know uh, tell you the gray matter that is the outer layer of the brain is the structural uh, you know that 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 show structural changes with mindfulness is really interesting to know mm. um, so there is increased cortical thickness um, almost like the cap of the brain, uh, that the brain, the gray matter, uh, changes are noted. Uh, basically, um, a, a altered in consistency in all the meditators, and if they are advanced in the process of meditation, like for thousands of hours of meditation, like in monks, etc. There, you know, there are like at least eight regions that show changes. Wow. Um, that's like um, Fox documented it in, and his colleagues documented it in 2014, where there is a increased thickness of frontopolar cortex that's in the front of the brain. And then there is also um, a mid cingulate, that's the middle manager between the frontal cortex and the bottom areas of the brain called anterior cingulate that we keep talking and mid cingulate as well as um, the, uh, the evaluative brain called orbitofrontal cortex. They all change in thickness along with the memory area called hippocampus. So the physical thickness? I mean, yeah, it physical. actually, in, in essence, kind of grows? The, the gray area, the, the, the density of the gray okay. area increases. Okay. Yeah? And also the corpus callosum, which is like a ribbon in the middle of the brain that connects the two hemispheres, also changes. And also the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which is like a ribbon on the top of the brain, like a long kind of bundle that pulls things together and transmits messages that also becomes thicker. And also the insula and sensory parts of the brain um, that or that bring body awareness, that's in, um, they also change. So there are many areas, the thinking parts of the brain, the middle manager, the memory area, the sensory areas, and also the kind of areas that kind of pull the brain together across the two hemispheres. They all increase in thickness and density in the gray matter for better functioning um, in, uh, in those who meditate. Um, so now we talked about the gray matter, then comes the, uh, white matter and white matter is interesting 
uh, it's like the you know Mike they are like white tubes across the brain like imagine um, little uh, tubes between different parts of the brain mm -hmm. okay so there is that white matter connectivity or connections in between all these gray areas of the brain okay uh, that carry the neuronal impulses okay so imagine water molecules are uh, moving in these neurons that are measured to understand the integrity of these uh, white matter tubes okay, okay? Uh -huh. so these white matter tubes that kind of measure the water's integrity its integrity through white matter through water movement it's called the diffusion tensor imaging but I don't want to go too much into detail mm -hmm. but um, this uh, the the functional connectivity is determined um, uh, across many of these gray regions as well through another mechanism called functional connectivity analysis and uh, uh, what happens is uh, what happened in the studies is that they showed increased white matter integrity in the resting state networks in general in the brain, so the, the, in these um, in these meditators, and also there is increased functional connectivity as well among these uh, uh, regions of the resting state and the prefrontal cortex connectivity. So there there is a lot of you know stability that's being obtained uh, with practice. So, in in simple terms. The communication or connectivity between different functional areas of the brain is improved. Yeah, especially those in the those networks of the resting state okay. areas, like frontal cortex, and then uh, dorsal anterior cingulate and posterior cingulate, like the front, you know, the front part of the brain, the back part of the brain, middle part of the brain, all of those that kind of. Uh, are connected at rest and they kind of stay calm and, okay. and and when you are not active and doing anything they just stay put you know and well connected and they are pulled into action and uh, with uh, cognitive control regions nicely when you're supposed to work and think okay so there is also increased cognitive control um, over the resting state network and they are pulled in and pulled out in a very more easy functional manner without being jerky in, in their function in, in simple terms, if, you have, if I have to tell you. Yeah, and, and, and so and one other thing, just resting state. Okay. Uh, what, what does that, I think I know what that means, but I, you mean uh, I'm When you're not just like, sitting. Yeah, we're always thinking something or the other, right? I mean, right. the real resting state is attained perhaps when you're not doing anything active, engaged in an active act, okay. and your brain is at rest. Okay. And so there are certain areas of the brain that are active in keeping the brain in the resting state. Okay. And that's the, you know, um, uh, medial prefrontal cortex, you know, the the, the the cortex in the medial side of the front of the brain and also the one at the back called posterior cingulate and also the middle manager called dorsal anterior cingulate they're all kind of involved in this resting state in mindfulness especially that remain well connected okay and and they also work and and you know what to add value i want to say one more thing uh -huh. hassan camp and others have published in 2012 where they also looked at all these patterns and and went on to further say that the people who are anxious um, seem to engage also with meditation practice uh, the ventromedial uh, or lower medial part of the brain on the front uh, is well connected to the resting state and you know therefore offer better control on anxiety so there's a greater access to the internal states due to this connectivity and they're able to uh, maintain tranquility a bit better and address their so, anxiety yeah exactly so there there are not only brain changes but their behavioral changes okay. associated with this mindfulness practice okay that has been shown um well that's fantastic really i mean uh but um i i'm going to go back to sort of there's mindfulness there's meditation there's tm you know transcendental meditation Zen. There's a lot of terms that get thrown around. I think 
sort of right uh, kind of not carefully right, enough right, and, and right. I don't know the difference between them or what the relationship right, between right. them are I know mindfulness practices um, you know were you know were included in actually many of the studies studied by uh, or included in meta analysis by several um, you know um, researchers vipassana meditation zogchen and zen meditation mindfulness based approaches such as integrative body mind training called IBMT oh. and then the mindfulness based stress reduction called MBSR uh, all of these have elements that are adopting the mindfulness practices from buddhist traditions hmm. and they're all about non judgmental awareness through uh, and moment to moment uh, in, in, increasing the focus and staying put um and these monitor these techniques have something in common and no matter which technique you use you know there are bound to be similar changes that we've been discussing and in fact there were studies uh, at least 10 studies and that included 91 subjects that was published by again the Hassan camp in 2012 and in 2011 as well where during the meditation the, uh, you know there also spur duty in 2012 have done this meta analysis with the 10 studies and 91 subjects by the way um you know uh, several of these meta analysis resulted in three regions being active that is the caudate and putamen uh, that is like the area that is involved in concentration at the base level that's active and um that is explained as not engaging uh in unnecessary things you know it's almost like attentional disengaging mm -hmm. uh from irrelevant information and also the area called parahippocampus Uh, is also engaged uh, you know and active because it stops from mind wandering possibly by emotional gaining emotional control and then there is also medial part of the front of the brain that increases self awareness you know so there is increased self awareness disengaging from attention and stopping the mind wandering all of these are happening in the brain uh across all these uh various subjects and and various methods of uh, mindfulness so you sh practice. shouldn't get hung up on the method so much as doing one or the other of them they all have some benefit and they all address the same kinds of thing i'd i'd say that yeah. i i i'd probably say that but you know i'm just more telling that Yeah. Uh, research is not like pure pure I gotcha. but like there is a gestalt of what is to be expected okay. and what is interesting mike is experienced versus novice people in the experienced mindfulness based practice there is prefrontal cortex that's kind of calmer and it's not so active and it's like the amygdala or not even amygdala the insula that is really more active so it's almost like from if the amygdala is active then they transmit the messages to prefrontal cortex in the process of course and then there is the insula that is active along with sensory cortex so it is aware of the one person is a person who's very experienced and advanced is aware of the bodily uh, a uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, experiences and they're aware of what's going on with themselves without being necessarily aroused you know and they don't have to put a lot of effort into thinking and you know pulling themselves together and all that it is you and i who start meditation perhaps then we might be really using more of prefrontal cortex to kind of like a horses uh, raining the chariot you know uh -huh. and say hey come on now you fall into place okay yeah. you know to the rest of the brain you know whereas the monks don't have to do it you know? they they i got it yeah. yeah i mean it's more like it's practice i mean it's sort of like yeah. you we you work at it you work at it but it would take more conscious effort to stop your brain from wandering um do you use the term before i forget you you you've used the term um non-judgmental awareness or um what is that i mean i think I, again it's one of these things where i think i have a sense of what that means but whereas you're you're, you're experiencing something and you're not going it's good or bad uh, you're just experiencing it is is that what you're talking yeah. about yeah i mean you're not like saying oh this is bad thought this is good thought 
You're just well, having the oh, thought. Yeah. I mean, oh, they're being critical. Or look at their face. You know, they're not smiling at me. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at, <laughs> look at me. I'm, I'm in my mirror, you know, if there's a mirror. I mean, like, oh, you know, I'm not happy. Or what about, you know, this morning my teacher wasn't really kind to me. Mm-hmm. Or um, usually we're all negative. You know, we can't kind of default towards negative. But yeah. I think eventually one would come to think hopefully positive thoughts but I think that you know not judging you know even like it's basically reducing excitability even mm-hmm. the positive oh my god my birthday is coming uh-huh. what is my husband going to get uh-huh. me it's just turning down the volume my husband would get me anything but yeah. I'm just saying <laughs> Well, you know, like you know, like uh, you you would really want to. I mean, you're not always like thinking, you know, what somebody's gonna, you know, be praising of you for something you've done. Or I mean, you're not really like calculating anything. Mm-hmm. You know, we're always calculating. And yeah, yeah. Sizing up things and analyzing. I mean, analyzing sometimes as a psychiatrist, I feel it's fine as far as you don't judge. But if you can understand the difference, yeah, you yeah. have to understand it. But you're not judging it. Right. You know, analysis comes kind of automatic, like second nature to me. Yeah. But, you know, are you judging? You know what? Judgment. I personally think, though, my judgment becomes less and less if you understand and empathize and know what's going on. And that kindness also Mm -hmm. increases with you calming down with this sort of practice, I think. Yeah. And personally, I think, though, mindfulness is great. But I also think that problem solving and thinking positive, keeping things simple, and emotionally processing things, all of them are really important. You know, mindfulness is not the only answer in my opinion. That's okay. But it is like an important part. And But, you know, people swear who do mindfulness that once you do it, like that would be it. But I think that the rest of the qualities of uh, emotion processing and, and non-judgmental attitude are good good byproducts of something like that, perhaps. Yeah, it seems to me that this is just a good basis and it might improve those things, Uh, but it's not a replacement or it's not a be-all and end-all. I I think so, Mike. I mean, you know what? I have my theory about this. You know, the stress is the most central thing that we all don't want to be facing, right? I mean, anger, anxiety, fear, depression, everything is arising from stress, right? Mm -hmm. And stress, if it's too severe... Or we as people are handling the emotions uh, in a closed manner, perhaps, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then we end up not being able to um, process the emotions of the stressful event. Mm -hmm. And we have panic, depression, schizophrenia, and all these serious things might develop, especially if you're predisposed to it, Mm -hmm. right? So it's almost like we have to learn to express our stress. A catharsis in words is important, organizing to keep them more, uh, you know, less fragmented, but get a framework to what has happened in the past or now. And, you know, all this talking and sharing with non someone else who's non-judgmental and helps you understand, lets the intensity fade with exposure and understanding and such narrative to your life and completeness and control is really very important in reducing stress. And and I suppose that one can also increase self-awareness and process one's own stress if you do mindfulness, perhaps, uh-huh. you know, with some some help. You can be, you can kind of be that person for yourself. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, at least you know, if you don't have like overwhelming stress, that you need extra help. You right, know? right. Yeah, yeah. I, obviously. Yeah. 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 Well, um, this has been terrific, uh, and I think I'm going to start taking 10 minutes a day and and just be and see what happens. You know what? That's what I've been doing with uh, many people now, you know, sitting down and letting them just focus on their breathing. Yeah. Stay for 10 minutes still. Yeah. And that's time for you. Yeah. 10 minutes is something that we, I think we can all figure out how to grab for ourselves. You know, it's not, it's not a, too big a commitment and um, no it's a great starting point now i think that's a gift you can give yourself so <laughs> mindfulness is something really wonderful it's scientific it's proven and it's yet to be proven a lot even more so but still it's time to begin to find that peace in yourself and peace in all of us and think positive keep things simple and let's just uh you know make sure that 
we just get this done for ourselves. Yeah. yeah. So after you're done listening to us, go grab yourself 10 minutes, okay? Just like the doctor <laughs> says. All right? That's it for this week, this session, I should say. Um, I'll see you and get yourself a good 10 minutes of mindfulness. Thanks, Mike. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.